Hi guys, so today I would like to give you five uh, advice and tips um, if you are uh, starting with fuzzing and vulnerability research. Uh, that's actually uh, some stuff that uh, I'm uh, applying um, and uh, that's um, the bunch of stuff I will be, um, I will have be happy to have uh, when I uh, start that uh, a long time ago. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm giving this, uh, this video. So the first one is uh, stop thinking that your target has no bugs uh, since uh, it has already been fuzzed um, in, in the past. So that's something really common. Um, and uh, uh, I often receive messages telling me, okay, I'm really interested in fuzzing, I don't know, like lib P2P or um, some other library, uh, but this library is already fuzzed by OSS fuzz and so on. Um, the first thing I want to say is um, you will only get results, your, your fuzzing result is dependent of the, the fuzzing hardness and the part of the code you are reaching. Let's say you have the libpng library and maybe there is one specific function in the API available that is not fuzzed at all in OSS fuzz and maybe in this one there is a, a bug. Uh, it will never be found because uh, they are not fuzzing, they are not targeting this part of the code. So uh, it's really important to keep in mind that um, maybe someone else, of course, already fuzzed the project, but it will not fuzz the same part in the same way using the same tool than you. So uh, it's still worth it, it's still interesting. And also another point I want to mention, especially when people ask me, oh, um, I want to do a fuzzing on browser, for example, uh, but there is a lot of people that are doing that and so on. Um, sure, there is a lot of people doing fuzzing on web browser, uh, but you can still find bugs. Uh, there is bugs that are found uh, every month, every weeks. Uh, and um, it's not just the part that maybe this bug is there for like quite a long time um, but it's actually the fact that uh, most of the bugs found uh, i would say during the year uh, will actually be introduced in the code base the same year uh, so that's really uh, important because that means uh, and that's also one point why uh, we often say that fuzzing should be something as part of the uh, the, the continuous uh, the, the ci the continuous integration because um the more code you are writing over the time, the more bugs you will have, uh, of course. And uh, it makes sense to just do fuzzing all the time. And uh, if you want to target a, a really old library, um, just keep that in mind. And maybe it should be interesting for you to focus on the new part of the code that have been uh, added. Let's say for libpng, if there is a, a new format or let, let's say like a, a video or audio library there is maybe a new codec that have been introduced in the library supported in the library could be really interesting to focus and target this codec uh, because since it's new code maybe you will have some new bugs so that's really uh, important uh, to to keep in mind uh, and it will also uh, keep you motivated for for the next part the second point is uh, stop spending hours to start fuzzing using like complex framework like libifl or uh, using complex techniques like snapshot fuzzing. Uh, it's especially true if you are new uh, in the in the subject. Um, I see a lot of people trying to do libifl, but uh, first of all, they, are, they have not played or done any project in Rust, and uh, they have not played with other uh, fuzzing framework before that that are way more easier to to use. Uh, libifl is a, a really awesome project. I really like the project. I really like the, the, the guys that are behind uh, are doing really an awesome job. Uh, but the fact is you need to start with uh, something more simple, simple technique, more simpler te technique before um, going into something complicated like that or even going into techniques like snapshot fuzzing that are uh, really easy and complicated to to put in place um, so that's my uh, that's my advice and also um, if you are doing something progressive uh, like that uh, starting with like dumb or smart fuzzing and coverage guided fuzzing if you have uh, of course the, the source code and so on uh, 
Um, by the time you will discover the target, you will discover new API, uh, you will discover maybe uh, take a look at unit tests and see how the library is supposed to work. And then it will be even more easier for you to just um, go deeper and deeper and improve um, your, your first target and your coverage. So that's why it's really like a win-win situation. You, you really need to just go step by step and uh, you will see that uh, at the end it will be way more easy and uh, less deceptive than just trying to start with the, the, the most efficient and the hardest uh, way uh, and uh, it's better to uh, to build like a, to learn from your adventure more than just your, your final goal. The third one is stop trying to optimize your further, especially if it's written in Python. Uh, I should put that in, the, in bracket, but that's the main idea because I receive a lot of DM telling me, okay, I have my custom further and so on. It, it, it's, it, I, I'm trying to optimize it and so on. Uh, the fact is, um, and it's what I mentioned, it's like trying to make your shopping cart efficient on the highway. Uh, at some point, it's not possible uh, anymore. So um, at first, it, it may be easy. You are testing stuff uh, and uh, you, you are doing like your proof of concept. But if you really want to have like an efficient further and so on, uh, you will need at some point to, um, to rewrite the stuff in, in Go uh, if it's more easy for you in Rust uh, and in the worst case in C and C++, but I really invite you to take a look at Go and Rust. Uh, that's for me the, the best language uh, and the, the language of the future. So you should definitely uh, learn that as well. And that will be the, the good occasion, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, switching from Python to Go is really, really easy. Uh, and uh, it should be something you, you give a try. Stop thinking a bug isn't worth reporting. Um, so maybe you will um, try to play with a, a really simple target, not used a lot, and uh, you will uh, not trigger like a RCE. Um, you will maybe just trigger like a, a panic, an overflow, uh, even just a memory leak. And um, you will maybe think, okay, that's not uh, high level bugs. Uh, I will not get a CVE ID uh, for that and so on. Uh, so first of all, for the CVE ID, I just want to be clear, uh, that's bullshit. Uh, you will most of the time don't get a CVE ID because you will do all the paperwork to get the CVE and you will never get it. Uh, so I, I prefer to be clear on that. I'm definitely not a big fan of the way uh, CVE the way it works uh, right now um, and the, the reporting and the validation uh, who is validating if your CVE, if your bug is really like uh, worth a CVE ID or not. Uh, but th that's another story. But just to mention, you will maybe find a bug that um, does not like uh, a really high end bug and really impactful um, if you are taking like a specific target, a specific program that is using a library that is vulnerable and so on. But you need to keep in mind that maybe this library or this project is used by some other project, some, some third party. Um, and actually a bug like that could be devastating. Um, I got the, the, I got this case uh, a lot of time because I, I'm working with a lot of blockchain software company uh, or, or blockchain uh, protocol and foundation. Uh, and basically the fact is they are using some third party library and those libraries are vulnerable and it will directly impact their own uh, blockchain uh, node or you can even think like a, like a server. And the fact that there is this vulnerability will impact the security of their own project. And just something like uh, a panic, an overflow, uh, in case of, for example, a blockchain uh, node, um, that means you can um, maybe trigger, like uh, you can have like a denial, complete denial of service or you can have um, like a, a logic bug that will uh, imply like a consensus bug for a blockchain and just split the network. And that's one of the worst case uh, we want. So um, something really simple, not really critical for, I don't know, like client side uh, program will be something devastating on the server side. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you need to, of course, you have your own context, the context of the target and the, the way you are doing the stuff. But don't forget that maybe it's used by someone else with uh, another context uh, that is way more critical. And the last one, 
is uh, stop thinking your infrastructure or laptop is not enough. So um, I know that uh, a lot of you are actually also looking and watching uh, Gamozo Lab with this amazing setup of like around 200 cores and so on. I really, uh, I hope I will get the same setup one day. Uh, it's really awesome and I, I'm definitely a big fan of, of Gamozo. Uh, but yeah, not everyone got a setup like this one um, and uh, it's actually really uh, costly uh, and, and so on. Uh, but it doesn't mean you you will not find any bugs. You will just not find maybe as many uh, and you will maybe not find them uh, as fast. But you can perfectly do the job with just your simple laptop. Uh, with uh, just like a, a four or eight core uh, laptop, uh, it will be largely enough. Uh, don't forget that most of the time people are, are running like uh, AFA, long fuzz and so on directly on, on their laptop for when they are doing audit and so on. Uh, to be honest, personally, when I'm doing uh, consulting and so on, uh, at first when I'm developing my first target and so on, I'm running everything on my system. And then when everything is set up, all the fuzzing harness are there and so on, all, all the longing fruit bugs are fixed. I'm giving the first target and they are running that uh, on a dedicated server on the CI and so on. And in the same way, it will be the same setup it will just be a server but maybe with like eight sixteen cores but nothing more um, don't be afraid of um, of just using something simple uh, as that um, we are not all like gamozo or we are not all like oss first with like hundred thousand of cores available uh, like google um, but uh, it's largely enough uh, and you should already get some good results uh, on that what is more important is not the, the number of cores. Uh, in that case, focus on the quality of the first target. The more, um, the more cut coverage, the more um, quality you are putting into your fuzzing harness, uh, the more chance you will get to, to trigger bugs uh, just with some really, um, like with a low number of execution. So I hope uh, all those uh, advice uh, help you. Uh, let me know if you have any other advice uh, that you think are uh, definitely worth it. Put that on the comment below. Um, and uh, of course, if you have any other suggestion of video topics and so on, uh, please um, give them to me and uh, I will be happy to create new uh, video uh, from that. Um, see you next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, see you in another video. Bye.